Welcome to the Enlighten Up podcast. I'm Lisa Watson and will be joined by my co-hosts Nicole Frolick and Brian Koenigberg. The Enlighten Up podcast is a weekly show that provides an unconventional and refreshing spin on spirituality, where three friends and weekly guests share informative, fun, and usually off-the-wall conversations. Unlike others, we provide fringe and skeptical viewpoints on all topics, because our experience has taught us that the echo chamber is a boring place from which to learn. So regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey, we can promise you, you're going to find a place to fit in here. So we invite you to grab a drink and listen in on our casual, entertaining, and hopefully enlightening conversation. And Enlighten Up is a self-funded podcast. So if you would like to help us to continue to be able to produce, enhance, and expand the show for our audience, then please send your support using the link in the show notes or go to our website, lightenup.us, and check out our merchandise shop where you can purchase merchandise that will allow you to express some spiritual humor. You may also show your support by leaving us a review on iTunes and following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you all so much for listening and supporting us. And now let's jump right into the episode. Hey, everyone, welcome back to the Enlighten Up podcast. Today, we are going to be taking a very deep dive into some uh, well, some topics that are pretty sensitive as well as mind blowing. We're going to be going into the deep space program, the secret space program, actually. Uh, we're also going to be getting into, uh, the MK Ultra, uh, program and we're going to be talking about human trafficking. So if this is a sensitive topic for you, just, uh, be mindful of that when it comes up, but it's going to be really informative and helpful for all of you to listen to. Today we are joined by Tony Rodriguez, who has undergone um, torturous MK Ultra programming. He has also been traded uh, through human trafficking, and he was uh, sold to the secret space program for a short period of time, where he lived on Mars. So, Tony, welcome to the Enlighten Up podcast. Thanks so much for being here with us. Hello, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, we haven't got into a lot of these topics yet on the show, so you're going to be uh, breaking the seal for us. Oh, boy. You're definitely the first person <laughs> that has ever lived on Mars that has been on our show. Great. Uh, good. Uh, well, I said I invited some skepticism, but I don't want to I don't want to see, seem like I'm coming from too far out in the field. But, you know, I'm not the only one that has come forward and said it publicly. Well, so. We'll keep it grounded. We'll keep it grounded. You know, we'll we'll get into like the little things like how mail forwarding works and all that kind of stuff. So. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Uh, Well, um, don't worry about it. The the weirder, the better. You know, we we don't want you to censor anything and don't feel like you have to hold back. Uh, Just give us whatever details feel comfortable and feel right for you to share. Okay. Okay. So. Sounds like we should start on Mars. (laughs) You know what? Uh, What's funny is a lot of sh- so I was only actually on Mars a short time, uh, about six months. From best I could tell, it's not like I had access to a calendar. I was there and I was basically treated like a piece of equipment for the program I was in, and it got canceled. And so I was taken to another to another colony on Mars, another city that was underground, and retrained for a new job or a new uh, task, and then sold off to the Ceres colony uh, on the planetoid Ceres. And so I was only there a short time, but a lot of interviews because there's a lot of other data and a lot of other people that talk about Mars. So a lot of interviews out of a two hour interview, I, I talk about Mars for an hour and the rest of the 20 years that I was out there um, for only, you know, 30 minutes or so, because there's a lot of detail and a lot of other um, a lot of other accounts that people want to cross reference things that I say. about. But in, in, in the 20 years, it was a 20 and back. I was only on Mars for about six months. <clears throat> oh, tell tell Brian what a 20 and back is, because I don't think he knows. So, you know what? And uh, having lived it, I I still don't know. You know, it's kind of like getting, uh, like I always tell people, like a kidney surgery. You know, they you get a kidney surgery, and when it's over with, they ask you, what they do to you? You really don't know what happened, um, but you had a surgery done. And so a 20 and back was the same way, but uh, there are diagrams that are easier to follow with the, uh, the way the timeline worked. But basically, I lived th- my life as Tony till I was 10 years old, then I was taken and I lived for 20 years in these programs. And, uh, you know, for, and I had amnesia. I had no idea of where I came from. I woke up, I had no memory of mom and dad or anything. I lived for 20 years. I was traded from black program to black program and into the space program. 
and out into uh, to the Ceres colony, the Mars colony corporation, and then put back. And so, so using some sort of technology they've acquired from extraterrestrials, and a, and this is where you lose people, and a, time, a component of time travel. I will right. Know. So there's 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 no way to know that you. This is not twenty Earth years. It's twenty Earth years, exactly. It is. No, it is twenty Earth years. But but you 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 weren't taken when you were ten years old and came back as a thirty year old man. That's right. So there is a technology. So I believe uh, just like uh, you know, there's more than one motor. There's more than one nuclear bomb. There's a fission. There's different methods to achieve the same thing. I think they have different methods of achieving the same effect of a twenty and back. So I was li- I went for twenty years. And I woke up the next day. I was only gone out of my house that I was taken of uh, maybe 30 minutes, you know, max. And I woke up the next morning and I was changed, but I had no memory of the 20 years. And I suddenly had my memories back. And if I went down, I remember waking up with the sensation that I hadn't been there in 20 years. And it was the next morning. And I got up and went down and had breakfast with my family. It was weird. Everybody in the house was kind of shell shocked. There was some weird stuff that happened the night before, but nobody remembered. My dad was different and I was different. I was never the same again. So, but I, I believe that in my case, they used cloning technology. And I think there are, there is age regression technology. I think there's a few different ways to do it. <clears throat> but um, what, for whatever, for whatever reason, I think once you, once you apply this, um, the possibility that this can happen and you start researching uh, accounts that people have talked about in the past, and then you think, whoa, they could have been taken for a 20 and back. A lot of things tend to line up. Um, what I've found with people that have contacted me since going public, uh, many people have contacted, thousands of people have contacted me with similar uh, memories. And what I've found is that, it, you know, if they're old enough, most people don't remember the 20 and back when they get a recall until the 20 years is over in their real life. So if you're taken at 10 years old, after you're 30 years old in your real life, then you'll start getting the memories more clearly. Uh, well, why do you think that is? Uh, well, because I think that there's a duality. I think that you got to think that there's two of you. And what, what it felt like during the 20 years was, um, how do I explain it? Like the, It felt like there was, you know how twins, if one twin gets his arm broken, the other one kind of feel, feels it. And mm-hmm. you kind of have that, there's some of that going on. So it seems like during times that I was traumatized in the 20 and back, then my, my life was also affected. And my behavior was affected. And after it was over, literally, the day, I remember one morning I woke up. It's complex because there was time travel. I was on. A, I served on a starship that traveled time as well. So we would leave in the morning, and we would get back in the morning five minutes later. We would go work an eight-hour day. So those all added up. So the, those counted toward the 20 years. But on the calendar years, I was only gone something like 18 and a half years. So I was returned. I was taken from 80, 82, and I was returned you know, uh, they said I lived from 82 till the year 2000, about 20, about 18 years. But I did 20 years because of the way that the ship had had burnt up uh, time and gone back in time. That's a whole separate kind of subject. But uh, you kind of lose people oh, on the time travel. Yeah. Part. <laughs> so it makes sense to me now why in the overlap of the 10 to 30 years, why you would after then get the memories because you don't have any interference of, I guess, overlapping psyches or I don't know. Yeah. Well, well, I got kind of sidetracked. What I wanted to say was that at the end of that, right around the year 2000, there was a day and I don't know why, but I woke up first thing in the morning and I kept saying to myself, it's over. It's over. I went, it's over. It's over. And literally Overnight, I kind of got my act together. Um, you know, like my life fell into place. Like I became more stable of a person. And you're a 10 year old boy still. No, no, 30. No, no. This is when I was an adult. Like oh, at the end oh. of it, this was the year 2000. So, like, if I was taken in 82, I, you know, after 18 years, it was a 20 year tour, but the other me did time travel on a ship. So it ate up about a year and a half. So it was in the uh. year 2000. When that person died, essentially your other person, you're living together in the same timeline. Like I could have met myself, you know, and um, when that person dies, effectively that person dies, then you kind of get all of your mentality. You you know, you get all of your consciousness back. Oh, weird. And I, I became a better person. Uh, I want to say that 
you know, when I was taken after that, I was kind of a, fl- a flake. And I, I knew, like, I remember sitting with my friends as a teenager going, something's wrong with me. And everybody was like, yeah, you got something wrong with you. You know, my, my really close friends. But and I was like, I don't know what, though. I, I didn't, um, you know, like I, I, I was in a stable lifestyle at home and everything. And I but I still had like PTSD. I still had a lot of things that were that didn't make sense. And uh, it was easy. Once I got the memories back in 2015, it was easy to look at habits and uh, phobias, things I had and uh, deal with them because then I could remember where they came from. Hmm. And it was easy to kind of put it all to bed after that. So you, okay. So you, in 2000, finally, uh, the, you started to feel normal, but your memories didn't start to come back until 2015. Exactly. Well, here's what happened is the memories. Okay. I, I had, um, memories of the intense things that happened to me the whole time, pretty much when they happened out up there. Uh, something intense would happen to me. I would remember it. I'd dream about it or even like wakingly remember it. And, um, but I didn't understand how it was much different than a dream because in the memories you can, I could think about how I got there and I could recall, uh, you know, how I got there and how I went back. So it was much different than a dream, but I, I would tell myself what, when could I have had, had a career on a spaceship when I would, when I would remember, remember it, I would say, when, when could that have happened? You know, and I would just kind of brush it off. That must've been a super dream, you know, an elaborate dream or something. And, um, it wasn't until 15. So I got an MRI scan. And then a couple weeks later, I came across the Randy Kramer, uh, interviews and where he explained the 20 and back technology. And I went, and once I learned about the time travel stuff that they take you for 20 years and then put you back a few minutes later, and I went, Oh my God, that, and and then once I accepted, the stronger memories, uh, the things, you know, the very emotional memory th- moments uh, were are the clearest memories. Mm. And so once I accepted those and I went, oh, my God, that happened. And then I would go to the next one. And go, oh, my God, that happened. Oh, that happened. And then it was like, uh, imagine the memories like a pitcher that was broken into all fragments on the ground. And it was like they all came together and began to coalesce into all the memories. And I still I still remember things. You know, but they're more like little details nowadays. Um, so what happened then at 10 when you were taken? Well, it was your standard, um, you know, abduction experience. There was a kid at school. I was in the Talented and Gifted program, and there was a very smart, very um, unique kid. And he was came to school in a limousine every day. He was in town for a little while. And it's funny because they canceled the program after he moved away. But he said uh, we didn't get along. We met every Wednesday in the camp, in the library for um, a talented and gifted tag, uh, advanced learning classes. <clears throat> and he said, "My dad's an Illuminati. What's your dad do?" <laughs> and you know, because we didn't like each other, uh, we were we were you know boy, young boys, and uh, we just didn't get along. And he hated. He where like where were you, where did you grow up? In southern Michigan, in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and. Um, one day, uh, his dad came in and was the uh, judge for the science fair, and he pointed me out to him, and it was that night, or the, or maybe a night or two after, but I think it was the same night, I woke up with a gray in my face, and uh, three shorter-looking reptile beings were also in my room and picked me up out of bed. I was paralyzed, and they carried me to the end of my bed. There was a bright flash of light, and I woke up on a uh, like an laboratory table. <clears throat> And um, they did some medical tests to me, and that's when it began. They put me down, and it was the same same kind of procedure, like in Fire in the Sky. With the uh, they put me on a table, and they put a, there was a late like a sheet, like a rubber latex sheet that they put over me, and the table sucked it tight, like it had a vacuum. And they cut open around my eye, and they cut my mouth around my mouth so I could breathe. And they said it was oh. to protect me from my own bacteria, like the bacteria that was on my body. They, they were communicated and said that, that that sheet would stop any of my own bacteria from getting in where they were going to have a surgery. And then there was a needle, like a big needle on an arm that went right in where my tear duct is in my eye and, and went in there. And then that was the last I remember. And then I woke up with no memory of who I was. And I was in Southern California in a uh, at an air base with other kids and maybe a dozen other kids. And there was a doctor and a nurse there giving me a medical exam. And that's when I went through the the MK Ultra stuff. Whoa. 
who was performing the surgery? It was a, uh, a like a white, tall, white, grayish looking alien, E.T. Okay. At that time. Uh, we, Yeah, we just had um, 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 Elizabeth April on and she was abducted by tall whites. Yeah, I think that... I think that the small grays are, um, what do you call it, uh, robots or drones. They're not actually. They're like a. They're like a uh, an android, and the tall whites are actually the ETs that are, um, you know, doing doing a lot of the medical stuff. Okay, so you're on this airbase with other children. How many children in, in on the airbase are there with you? Well, look, it was like three portables um, that they had. It was they cobbled together from a much bigger program that got canceled and uh, it was, they just ran us kids through. It was about a dozen of us. I want to say about a dozen. And um, it went on for some months and it, they were, there were three portable. We slept, we slept and showered in one portable. And then we, they would put us on in chairs with, uh, with helmets that sh- would shock you, would shock, you know, and uh, we'd watch movies over and over. They drug, they, they gave you some drugs and the shock helmets and they were movies that were like cartoons it was disney cartoon clips and then news clips of people being murdered and then animals being murdered and then all kinds of subliminal stuff in there like words flashing really quick and then back to cartoons and it would just loop and we would watch those movies for all day eight hours a day and it'd be a different movie the next day but they were all just as they were they were revolting and but uh you were we were strapped in a chair and you couldn't look away you couldn't not watch it and um, that went on for a long. And then at the end of the day, there were times of the day when they would do something like, you know, like at one point I got my arm dislocated. Um, they would he had a contraption that did that or it would break your arm and then they would leave it where you would be in pain and then go back to the movies. And then every every day they would they would bring us in one at a time and ask you questions about, you know, how you felt about what happened, what was going on. He was very matter of fact. The doctor was very scientific about it all. He he was very matter of fact and uh, was not emotionally connected at all. And he would say, look, I'm a doctor. I'm going to fix your arm. Don't worry about it. You know, it's just some pain. This is part of it. It's a process. You're going to be fine. And, uh, you know, they'd wake us up in the middle of the night, come by and shock us with a, with a, uh, something that would like a cattle prod thing that would shock you. They'd shock you and then you could go back to bed and then they'd wake us up in the middle of the night, make us go out on the runway. There was an air, it was an air base. And we'd go out on the runway and they'd put us in ice water until we shivered. And then we'd go back to bed. And that went on uh, for months. And then they eventually started with sleep deprivation, where every 15 minutes they'd wake us up and they'd smack you or shock you. And then you'd go back to sleep. Then 15 minutes later, they'd wake you up again. And after that happened, I kind of lost all track of time. Uh, so I don't know what really what happened after that because of a couple of days of not sleeping. And uh, it was very... Very, very, very disorienting at that point. Yeah, well, it's well, it's done to fracture the mind. Yes. You said you didn't have any memories until 2015. No, well, like I said, I had memories, but they were they were of um, the emotional stuff. You know, I had I had I had I had a life up there. You know, when I lived on the series colony for a while, most of it, I was a slave, and I was live. It was like a prison. It was like living in a prison or a uh, yeah, it was just like a prison but with no bars like I could come and go as I wanted but there was really nowhere to go I didn't have any money and uh, there were just other men you know there were thousands of other men that lived in it too but at, toward the end of it I got promoted and I had earned a career where I did get some money and I could travel and then I, I formed relationships I had friends I had girlfriends I had a life uh, even though I was a slave I had uh, done well I mean considering where I started from and so there were times that were highlights and the, the, the highs and lows, uh, you know, there were times I got beat up and uh, the highs and lows of that time. I, and I guess that was farther away from the mind fracture stuff. You know, I changed, I healed over those 20 years. Like the, the original stuff, when, when I was in Peru, I was uh, like a basket case. Uh, I wasn't right. I was like a mental kid. But later on in those 20 years, I kind of got it. I kind of healed and became more of a, of a um, self-sufficient adult, you know, like I healed and those memories I always had, I always had those memories of the high lows. So the MK ultra, that is 
like a training program to get you ready for this this 20 and back deep space slave thing or is that something else okay so yes they okay so that was our what what happened was they were trained they would set you up to do a task and then you would do that task until you were no longer good at it and then it would repeat you'd go i went into another uh trauma-based mind control thing and then got trained for a different task so the original task he after we went through the 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 original programming of the MK Ultra stuff, and this was at Inyo Kern Air Base in Southern California, right next to China Lake. Um, the result of that program was that if I were shocked, if I got if I was shocked with an electrical current, no matter what I was doing, I would stop, and I would await commands, and I would do whatever I was told at that time. So I could be fighting or doing whatever, having making dinner, and if I got shocked, I would stand stand there. And I would accept commands. And that's what we all went through. That was the very first thing that happened with the sleep deprivation and all that. Then he tested us. We tested and he called us in and he said that uh, we tested Theta, whatever that was. <clears throat> and it was psychic service. And we went into remote viewing training. We went into, they did hemisync training. He, he was taking stones and hiding them in the desert. And giving us drugs and we'd go to sleep and we would he would have us do out of body stuff and try to find the stones and it, i found the person and i found the the funding for the program it was an offshoot of project grill flame and i've caught i've found documents that link the funding of that with um, research institutes that had personnel that had experience in mk ultra specifically in sleep deprivation uh of MK Ultra, so these are all things that I found after I documented that I remembered this stuff. Um, but in the beginning, it was it was psychic training. What they did was they would drug us. We'd get an IV, and you know, like something you know, an IV in your arm, and they drug us, and we would lose. Con- I would lose consciousness, and when I woke up, the people that were around me were would always be in shock at things I said, like I was channeling, uh, whatever other I don't know. Uh, but I believe I was channeling other entities or other people could talk through me. So they stationed me. I went from there to Seattle for the guy that owned me. I had a private owner. He was a billionaire in Seattle and he was a worshiping Satanist. And I witnessed a few um, satanic rituals and then they would drug us and he was getting business, uh, I I guess, um, information. But then from there, I was shipped off to Peru, Porto to Watansuyo, Peru. And they were shipping cocaine from there to Santa Marta, Colombia. And I rode right on a plane. And after we got up in the air about an hour, I had a handler and he would drug me. He put an IV in me and they would drug me. I would lose consciousness. And I was a, like a uh, warning system. If the police or the weather or something bad was going to happen, I would, I was a warning system for them because they had lost a plane before. And when I woke up, he would say that he spoke to his grandmother, his dead grandmother. He said that there were times when I was under that I spoke fluent Spanish and I don't speak Spanish. And he said that uh, after a while, after a few months of it, people from the town we were in, he had a he had a paper that he would read questions to me while I was under. And it, so they had their own way. It was a this was a militarized technique for psychic uh, ability for ESP or you know, whatever you want to call it. OK, hold hold on a second. So what you're saying is that when they would drug you. You, you don't have any conscious memory of that part when you were when you went under right but you were able to uh, intuitively pick up on where the the police were or um like you would be able to tell them if you know that they were going to be basically caught yes yep that's exactly what my purpose was that was my job so so you were like an intuitive tracker on the police Yes. Or the weather. Um, I guess they had lost a plane in bad weather. That was an also an issue. And they said that I gave them navigation, that they got lost and I navigated them to where they were going. He said that that happened. Huh. <clears throat> and they, okay. uh, it was, it was a C-46 commando cargo plane. And they said after that happened, they wanted me to be more familiar with the towns we flew over. So they had me fly one of the flights looking out the little window in the front that that particular plane has a window in the front of it. And I got to crawl up there and look out of it. And they said, and they were yelling down, like, this is the town of, uh, you know, whatever town it was. And they were telling me the towns as we flew over them so that while I was under, I would be more familiar with the area because I had guessed apparently 
navigated them through bad weather. Hmm. The other thing is, what the very first flight, um, nothing happened. When he drugged me, I guess it was gibberish, and he called. Uh, so they took me back. They were gonna they were gonna get rid of me, and he called and said that I didn't work. And what they did was they sent a, a silver mesh blanket for the because it was monthly. It was once a month that those flights happened. He sent a silver mesh blanket, and they said that the electronics from the from the airplane were interfering. So they wrapped me in a in, in a silver mesh blanket that was an EMF blocker, and he he would wrap me up in it and then drug me and put me under. And he said that time it worked. And when I when I woke up on the way home, he was he, silently like he was scared. He was afraid of me, and they and that's when it kind of began. It was like everything changed. You know, in the beginning they didn't believe that I was going to do it. You know, when they told them what I was going to do. Nobody believed it. And the first flight, you know, kind of kind of confirmed their fears because I didn't say anything of substance. I was it was gibberish on the second flight when they wrapped me up in a silver mesh blanket. Then I guess it worked. And I was giving him information that uh, I guess I shouldn't have had access to. It was, you know, it was like intuitive information. So what were you doing then when you weren't on the plane, if it was just once a month? I had a little cabin. Uh, in the town and it, it was just a bedroom and a bathroom with what with a door wide open it was really muddy and I had a black and white tv and I was um, I was a nutcase you know like my brain was I had been through MK Ultra, and so I was mentally not there I was mentally handicapped at that point and I remember I, I just laid around in that and that they would bring me food and um, they would come and get me. He took me into town sometimes. There was a place that there was a restaurant that would look like a cafeteria. And sometimes he would take me there. But there was no, the, you know, it was it was muddy. Uh, it rained quite a bit in the winter time there. And it was very, very muddy. So I would just stay in my room. And there was people that nearby that watched me like I couldn't go anywhere. And that that was my that was my life. So that you just spent the whole time in a cabin otherwise in the plane once a month approximately how old were you uh well i was there two and a half winters um so from 10 11 12 from 10 till about 13 and it was right around i was hitting puberty and i lost the ability so what happened was i was getting sicker and sicker uh, when i woke up and from uh each time that he put me under and i i was getting i guess it was more and more gibberish what i was saying and i didn't it didn't work like whatever the ability was it, i lost it right around puberty so between 10 years old and 12 and a half right in there hmm. Hmm. so like the hormonal um changes interfered with po- possibly um uh, i wasn't supposed to have sugar and his mom um i wasn't supposed to eat sugar so it was like a diet. I was on a really strict diet and his mom brought So these, so this is in Peru. So I've, again, I've never been there, but, uh, she would sneak me these things that were like, it tasted like cornbread, but it was really sugary. They were like little muffins that she made. They were balls, like a ball, like a muffin. And they were, it tasted just like cornbread, but it was really, it had a, a lot of sugar in it. and she would come by and sneak me food. She would come by all the time and give me food when uh, she wasn't supposed to. And he told her not to. I remember him telling her, I told her not to. If she, he, he said, if she comes by, you tell me. And I never did. I didn't, I didn't rat her out because it was, it was food. You know, it was like a big deal for me to get anything to snack on. And uh, I think the sugar might have had something to do with it as well, because I was getting sick. And, and I think that uh, whatever drug they were giving me probably didn't work with sugar. Oh, Okay. Oh, that's interesting. So then once they f- realized that you weren't of use to them anymore, what did they do? So a cargo plane came and got me. And, um, you know, it was sad because that that toward the end, like in the beginning, nobody talked to me or anything. But toward the end, it was like the whole town knew about me. And they lined up. I, there was a, it's about a mile and a half from town to the airfield, to the airstrip. And they lined up on the town and they were waving goodbye to me. And they called me the crazy... The adios, uh, los uh, loco pequeño de la luna, uh, the crazy boy from the moon. They were that's what they were saying, I, and they would wave. The kids were waving. Like I didn't have, I wanted friends, and I was, I felt very, um, 
I felt very traumatized because I wasn't allowed to play with the other kids. I would watch them play in soccer. They always had soccer balls and they'd run around and, and I would watch the other kids and I'd ask him if I could go play. And he's like, no, you can't, you know, he's like, don't ever talk to anybody. And so that was like, uh, it was painful to me. So on the, when I left and they were all waving at me, people waved and I rode on the back of a truck and, uh, you know, in the whole 20, in that 20 and back, I didn't remember my family. I didn't have a family. I was, I was basically like an orphan. And uh, that moment was, was really huge to me. And the rest of the time, the rest of the 20 years, I always said that I wanted to go back there, that that was like my family. Oh my gosh. And uh, I want to always wanted to go back to Peru. I still do. But what I've, I've looked into trips there um, now, and it's a very dangerous place. There's illegal gold mining and there's illegal, there's still the cocaine industry is there. And people, I'm a gringo, and if you don't speak Spanish and you're a gringo, it's very, it's very dangerous to go into that area um, just willy nilly. And uh, it's very, it's very, it's a very real possibility that you could get hurt. Mm. So okay, so you leave Peru and then you go to where? Seattle. I went back to the home in Seattle. The billionaire's home. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, now it had been remodeled. The downstairs it had a very large basement, and it had been remodeled. They they took the Satan theme out. Well, it wasn't a Satan theme. It was just your, you know, it was a, you know, uh, I've since found the house for sale for like fifty million dollars. He's passed mm. away. Um, no, downstairs originally had a den, like with pocket doors that opened up, and in there is when he had that ritual, and um, that I had witnessed. And they changed it and they had, they, they, the downstairs, they put bedrooms in. There was a little room that was like a hutch. And there was, uh, I think, three, three or more bedrooms put in. Plus that den was converted into a bigger bedroom. And they had uh, boys. Um, at any given time, there were six, six to eight boys living there uh, that were foster kids. And uh, I think that's how they were doing it. And, <clears throat> that that property had other homes on it too. It's like a 500 acre property. So I think they had girls in other homes that they were, that they had. Um, and the kids changed. Um, you know, there, there was two, three, two or three that stayed there the whole time with me, but they tended to come and go. Kids would come and go. And I remember one time a kid came, came there and tried to escape and they got rid of him. Um, they caught him and then got shipped him off somewhere. So they were trafficking kids, kids, but it was they had a they had a legal legality about it, saying they were a foster care um, home. But you you were one who was a bit more consistent then, right? Well, I was okay. So at that time, I had already been to the moon once, like in in between the MK Ultra programming on uh, Inu Kern base, we went to the moon and had surgeries done to us for that for that theta programming when we went into that programming mm -hmm. there was a there was a big triangular ship that picked us up there on the runway and we went to the moon so i told them in peru that i'd been to the moon there was a base on the back of the moon oh and when I that's got to why they Seattle, told called you the crazy moon guy crazy boy from the moon exactly yeah. because i told them there was a base and i remember i remember him when i told them that the, the the one guy owned me and well ran everything there and the other guy was my handler and they were they were just ecstatic when i said that and they the gringos, you know, the Americans put a effing base on the moon, you know, like they were just like high fiving about it because they like I knew it. And uh, <clears throat> but so I'd been there. And when I went to Seattle with the other kids, I was pulled aside by hurt by his wife, who was basically there all the time. He was never there. He was very rarely there. But she took care. Of, she was our handler. She took care of us. And she always said that she was a slave just like us. we were. She never had any money. Um. But she pulled me aside and said, look, you're going you're to make no mention of anything of the moon or anywhere that you've been to anybody. She said, and there was always, they threatened, you know, you'll be killed, you know, but, and I was so, kind of scared of everything. I, I always, I never had any reason to doubt that they would make good on that. Um, so I was forbidden to speak about it, but I remember during those times in Seattle, I would always look up at the moon and I knew something was there, I, you know, and uh, <clears throat> during those years. But what happened was during that time, us boys, they were using us, they would drug us and they would take us out to parties and we would be raped. And these were uh, the ones that I remember were fundraisers for um, for uh, 
politics. They were political fundraisers. And they had girls too that would be taken, but we we wouldn't have contact with the girls would be like, you know, on the other end of the party. And we we they would tell us we had to stay on a carpet. You had to stay right here. And uh, we were used for, uh, we were sex slaves. Sex slaves at a party for the guests to use? Yes. And was this something that all of the guests knew about or was it people who were in the know? Well, uh, well, what happened was, is they would have a regular party for the public during the day. And that would go till nine or 10 at night. And then later on about 11, 10, 30, 11, after everybody left, there would be less, you know, maybe a hundred or 200 guests. And they, yes, they, they were in the know. We were a, we were a booth, and, you know, in a carnival atmosphere. There was, they had a bar set up across, you know, they had a dance floor, they had a booth, an area where you could just go and have sex. Uh, With children. Yes. Well, teenagers, you know, young, young teenagers. We, there, it wasn't, you know, when you talk about the, the pedophilia, it wasn't, we, we were young, but at that time I was, you know, I was there from 13 till about 16. Was how yeah, long that went on. You're still a child. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's still very, very, still very young. But you got to think they were too. Well, you know, it, it wasn't like they were had super young kids there. They were all young teenagers. So, um, and unbeknownst to the guests that were having sex with us, we were we were always told to face a certain direction because off in the distance they had cameras to take pictures of them. So for blackmail. Well, yeah, I, I, I can only assume that. But our instructions were, you know, mine, I mean, I don't want to, how, how graphic do you want to get on here? But my instructions were to put your face down in this direction. Look at this. There was a carpet with a, there was a carpet we were on and there was a design in the middle of the carpet. And they said, never face that way, always face that way. And the reason was they pointed off into the bushes and it was a long ways away. You couldn't see, but there was a guy with a camera in the bushes filming so they could get the face of the person mm -hmm. yeah so okay so i mean i've heard of that for a while that a lot of um political people celebrities um bankers this sort of stuff people are you know a lot of times people well they have no idea that this is that they're being filmed i real. mean and but it's it's very real and that eventually this blackmail gets used against them to for them to basically be owned and do whatever needs to be done to um what's the word yeah. i'm looking for yeah for any kind for anything i mean you gotta yeah. think it's probably pretty effective i also want to say for the skeptics that um i Research that I, I remembered these memories and found the a property and found the people. I found his obituary and I found evidence of the parties. And this was all in 2015, April, May, about July of 15, when I documented all this with some researchers that were working with me. And I want to say that all of the um, pedo gate and all of the Hillary emails and all that came out after that. So it's not like I saw this. I was the first person and the only person that connected any kind of secret space program to any kind of satanic ritual worship to any of this well before none of this, none of this came out in 2015. If you look back to any of the Hillary scandal or any of the scandals that have hit, hit, come since then, it wasn't before 2015. Okay. It was 16 okay. and 17 that this is all since this is all came out. So, I mean, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately it's one of my best pieces of evidence of my account. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was on um, Gaia. I was on Cosmic Disclosure season 13, and they had originally filmed four episodes, but they cut it all out because they had their little scandal about the Satanism, about the Satanic stuff. So they they cut all of that out and they only talk about the space time on my uh, scenes on Cosmic Disclosure. But oh, wow. it's really the best evidence for my account. It's, it really supports my account the best. Um those years, the, the, the time, in, I guarantee there's evidence in Peru somewhere down in that town. There's somebody that'll recognize me or remember me. And that would prove the whole thing. Oh, okay. Hold on a second though. I need to think about that for a second. They would be though, 20 years older than you. If someone was your age at the time, 
that you were, they would be 20 years older than you if you were to run into them? Well, no, they'd be, um, well, okay. So for instance, I think his name was Manuel or I want to say it's Miguel or I want to say it's Manuel was his name, the guy that took care of me. And so I was 10, 11, and he was in his early 20s. So he's 10 years older, so he should be in his 50s by now. <clears throat> well, the reason well, the reason why I say that, um, oh, no, okay. I'm confused, too. It's okay, Nicole. Yeah, I, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, it's confusing. It's, you know what? It's a lot. If you're not familiar, if you don't sit and actually draw everything out and look at the timeline, the timeline stuff is much better when you can draw it down yeah. and visualize it because it's complicated it's complex and you got to think that if this is technology that they're using in black projects i mean well let, it, let's it can, get, get, let's, it can tie itself in a knot pretty quick let's dive into the stuff that's easier to believe because sure. you're you're still you know a teenager you're you know a sex slave when did you start living off planet you you went to mars and then you lived in other solar systems and on spaceships and stuff, you know, that's sure. Okay. So, uh, okay. So after a couple summers, I love that that's easier for you to believe. Well, <laughs> my tongue might have been in my cheek. <laughs> okay. I just needed to check there. Cause I was like, am I having like a moment of so, insanity? Here? <laughs> yeah. Well, what happened was what happened was in, uh, so after 15, when I got my memories back, the following year in 2016, I think it was September of 16, I went there. I went to Seattle and I told my family, I said, I got to I got to go find out if this is, you know, I got to Because I, I, I have looked up bits and pieces of everything that I can possibly research that I remember. I've looked up and each time I, I, I wish, I, I hope that it's wrong. And what's happened has been the opposite, that I went to Seattle and not only... Not only was it like I remembered it, it was freakishly accurate. Everything I remembered was super accurate. The store with the candies, still there. The other store turned into a restaurant, was a store back then, still there. Um, the pie store, there was a pie store that she brought pies home and the other boys ate. I never got a slice I was mad about. I remember that. I, I wrote that down. I told people about it. And I went there. The pie store is still there. And I'd never been there. So that happened. So at that point, I, I it was like I wanted it to all not be real. Do you get Do you get what I'm saying? Like I wanted this to just be something like a you know like some other condition that I could break off. But yeah, it was, it's like wanting to wake up from a nightmare. Exactly, that's exactly right. I, I didn't want this to plan out. I didn't want every time that I found some the the opportunity to prove it to actually pan out, and that's what's happened. Every time that I look something up that I remember, oh, oh you know what I remember that I'm going to go look at it. I go, oh oh my god, it's real exactly how i remember it and i went to seattle i went to the i went to the island i the google maps took me to the home and when i got halfway there i thought that's not the way i gotta go this way so i turned right and i went away from google maps and it turned out that i went the better way because the way that google maps took me had me over go over about a quarter mile of dirt road and so i i knew the route that was all pavement that was a little bit longer and i knew that mm -hmm. you know and I, I was on the phone with researchers uh, with, with some research that I worked with the whole time uh, talking about that stuff. So if I have to, so my reasoning was if, if my memories of Seattle and of Peru and of California were all this accurate, I also have to trust that the space memories are real too. Even though I can't go to Ceres, I can't go to Mars and say, yeah, this is the place. I remember it. You know, I can't do that there. Um, I have to go ahead and, and keep talking about them at, as if they're just as accurate a memories as what the other one, the earthbound one. Fair enough. So what, what happened in Seattle was that we were, we were getting up every morning and doing calisthenics. They kept us skinny. We, we were on a very tight diet. It was one egg, one piece of toast for breakfast. It was a random thing for lunch, and it was a tofu salad. It was one block of tofu and a salad for dinner. That's, it was just the bare amount of calories, what we needed every day to survive because they kept us skinny. And, and you think about what purpose they had us for. That's why we got up every morning. We took a we took a little cup of um, you know, like a Jello shot plastic thing. You, you know the Jello shots, one of those mm -hmm. full of pills. We had five or six different pills in there, and we would take those and we'd do calisthenics. And, and then we you know after breakfast, and then we had the rest of the day. We had a swimming pool, and it was just like being in a foster home, like an orphan in a foster home with a bunch of guy, boys. We were all mean to each other and. Uh, we sat around the pool. We didn't have anything to really to do. But one day they changed the pills to a different 
formula. And by the third day of taking the new pills, I was violently ill. I was I had an allergic reaction to whatever they were giving me. And she said, you know, you either got to take these or you're going to be sold off to the military. And uh, I want to say that the military military officers frequented that property. Also, that there were guys so they knew they were military. Well, parts of somebody in the military, they were it, it was frequent and she was getting uh, pharmaceutical drugs like intravenous drugs that she kept in the refrigerator that were uh, clearly illegal. She would meet a, a somebody uh, on the island once in a while and they would give her a, a bag of those, whatever they were. They were uh, intravenous drugs from like like hospital grade uh, drugs, whatever they were for. But um, so she uh, she said I, she said she called and said, can't you call and see if I can go back to the other uh pills that we were taking that okay and she said no nope. they she she called her husband and he said no nope. and then she quit talking to me and it was probably a week week to two weeks later she drove me to the back of a store there was a big shopping mall uh, not a shopping mall but like a like a like a grocery store and she took me in the back and i met there were two guys in a van and they gave me a shot and i lost consciousness and i woke up on a ship going come on final approach to the moon. I woke up like in my seat, like, you know, it was just like riding an airplane. They look same like airplane seats, but the rows instead, you know, an airplane has 12, 14 seats. This one had 20, 30 seats wide. And I woke up and there was an officer, like an a Air Force officer, I assume, sitting next to me. And he was like, you know, don't move anywhere. I'm the one that's in charge of you. You're just going to sit there. And I felt sick. And uh, we were on approach and I went to uh, back to that base on the moon. And they, it was, it was more of the same. It was like a, a white, you know, like a tall white, uh, gray alien. And he would, he would strap us in and it was, a, it was a better, uh, setup, but it was my own TV screen and, and they were, they were movies. And, uh, it was like, you would strap it, strap in so your head couldn't move and you'd watch the movies and they were all about fight or flight response. Like it's better to die for your brother than to run away from a fight. And it was just like that. It was like constant programming. And it went on for weeks like that, you know, and I'd get up in the morning and then they, when they were done, they put me, I had a little, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a eight by eight room, a cell that they put me in with, with blankets on the floor. And that's where I stayed during that. And, um, on the moon. Yes. Yeah. And it was, it was a fight or flight response. And then from there they tested us against one of the larger bugs on in and we, we flew to another base on the moon a different base and we marched what we took an elevator down we marched down a bunch of hallways to a like an arena area and we were trained to be suicide uh we were trained to be suicide uh bombers you know for lack of a better term they gave us a grenade that uh, wasn't a grenade as soon as it looked like a monster drink size can you know, like a Red Bull size can, mm. maybe a little mm -hmm. bigger. And it had a red button on the top. And he said, once you walk through those doors, that that will arm. And when you hit that button, it will immediately explode and you'll be killed. And so uh, it, you might want to think about saving everybody else's life if you're going to lose your own. That's what, that was our instructions. We walked through the door and it closed behind us. There was about 12 of us, a dozen of us. And we huddled together and there was a giant insect that came in on the other end of the, the other doors on the other. It was about the size of a basketball court and it had sand on the floor, like an inch of sand, a couple inches of sand. And it was a giant insect. And one of the boys ran up to it and detonated that thing and blew himself in half and blew its head apart and killed it. And they, there was a crowd. They cheered and they took us in, gave us medical examinations. We stayed in the in the hospital bed overnight. And the next morning we went on a bigger ship and we flew to Mars. So one of the kids sacrificed himself. I was told, no, he didn't join us on Mars, but I was told that he lived. But he was blown in half. I literally watched him. He was blown in half, like right above the hips. Uh, and like he was carrying it like a football and he ran as fast as he could right into the bug. And he blew up and it blew its head apart. Like he was, he landed on its head. And it, he, so, uh, but they said he lived. Hmm. And, you know, so these bases on the moon that you were in, were they everything underground? Could you see them from above? Like when you, you were. You could see them from above, right? And the, the, so the ship, 
like the wall would turn transparent and the pilot gave would tell you where you're coming like just like when you're on an airplane and they say if you look on your left you can see the grand canyon you know like a like a sightseeing thing like mm-hmm. a little um presentation and he would say that he said that the the base that i went to looked like the pentagon but it was a trap it was a trapezoid shape <clears throat> and he said he said that you, if you'll notice it resembles the pentagon that it turned out that they saved a lot of money they were in a hurry to build it and they saved a lot of money using the same plans from the pentagon because it's designed so tough the pentagon is designed for a nuclear war and he said it's designed so tough that it was easy to adapt the design for uh uh what do you call it for to be in a vacuum to be in space and so they could they took those plans for the actual you know the construction of the building and then just changed the uh layout and built the building it was quick and it, he said that it, they did that to be for, for economical reasons and so wait you said you could see the base from the ship but then it was transparent like no, no, the... No, the ship's wall turn trend they turn oh, it the off. ship's wall yeah the wall oh. like imagine being on an airplane with all the windows closed and then all of a sudden they flip a switch and it's not only the windows but the entire wall from the floor to the ceiling turned transparent whoa okay that i didn't catch the first time <laughs> okay so you were on the moon when did you go to mars so we were there, I mean, it was only a few months, I'd say, a month or two months maybe on the moon. Then they tested us against that bug. That happened. And then we got up the next morning. We got on a bigger ship. We went to Mars. And it was the same kind type of craft. It was, you know, there were lots of seats, but it was mostly empty. Uh, we all sat together, but uh, most of the seats were empty. And there were other kids that were a little older than me that were on the, sitting on the other side. And we got to Mars quickly. But we had to wait to uh, land and we stayed in orbit for like two hours, two or three hours waiting for clearance to land. And uh, that was the one time that I always regretted. They turned the gravity off and he said we could we could you could unbuckle and uh, experience the zero gravity while we were waiting. And I was just too scared to unbuckle and do it. And I watched the other kids uh, do it and kind of float around in zero G. And I never really got that chance again. Uh, while I was up in space to do that. So I always regretted not doing that. Question. What does Mars actually look like? Uh, Well, it's um, honestly, a lot of the rover pictures are good. Um, Most of the, uh, most of the places I walked were hard. It wasn't sandy. There uh, there was sand and blowing sand, but the the ground that you walked on was like clay and really hard, rocky. There were places with dunes of sand that we ended up walking on, and uh, but and then the sky was blue. It's a is a light blue during the day, and um, the weather comes in really fast. It can come in and get windy and and cloudy, uh, or, you know, dusty, and then it can go away just as quick as it comes. And what's the atmosphere like? Like, how are you there? I mean, it- so I think we were surgically all, and I'm guessing now. Um, I'm speculating. I think we were surgically altered to be able to breathe there. I think that there was a procedure they gave us for that. But it was just like being, if you've ever been in a high altitude above 10,000 feet on a mountain, Mm -hmm. it it felt like that. It was very cold and the air was thin. The suit, so they gave us environmental suits and the soldiers had entire um, armor suits that they were in. And they had negative buoyancy or, or equal buoyancy, whatever I'm saying that term right. Their suits weighed were heavy enough to where they were, it was like they were the same weight they would be on earth. So they were weighted down so they could run and jump. They could run just like they would run on earth. We um, didn't, we had just an environmental suit. It was very comfortable. It was a bright white suit and the face, the face part was open. And after the suit would pick up when you started to get stressed and it would give you oxygen, it would, you know, it would just spit out some oxygen, but it wasn't regularly like every breath. So that way it lasted a lot longer. Um, but we were not buoyant. So I was lighter on, on the surface in, while we were out during our, our hikes. When we did our missions, I was lighter than I, than I am on Earth. So you couldn't really run that great. You would, it would turn into hopping and uh, you would end up we, like I always fell down after a while. Like I couldn't really run that fast, uh, move that fast. Mm-hmm. Inside the base, there was artificial gravity. Now they have gravity plating 
that is uh, powered, and they can turn it up and down. But it's they can they have artificial gravity, and as soon as you walked off, the, the doors would open. And as soon as you walked off, you would jump in. You would go into the lower gravity, and you could feel it. But it was always nice to get back inside. The, right when you walked inside the doors, all of a sudden you could walk normally, and it was great. Oh, so interesting. Um, Brian, Lisa, <laughs> we're here. What do you say? Well, I don't know. I'm just wondering if anything's going through your minds. It's, and and I, I would assume when our listeners listen to this, they'll be slack jawed and <laughs> just listening. And I mean, there's, there's, you know, you can, you can be a skeptic. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. This is right outside of normal comprehension sure. and- um cannot be proven um cool story i mean it's like we'll make a movie about your life or write a book and it's you know nobody's gonna believe it's real so you might as well call it fiction well uh like i said the all of the space stuff i really now there have been things about series that i have dug up after the fact that turned out um that panned out that I that I researched and I went, wow, that's that is just how I remember it as well. But uh, like I said, the the earthbound stuff, I've been able to find evidence. Any of the space stuff, I really don't have any evidence to, you know, other than like I said, series, other than the layout of series that I remembered and I spoke with people prior to discovering it. Um, the Dawn mission went and mapped series, and I got my memories back right before a lot of the info came out. Dawn was already there. Yeah, I mean, you're you're talking about n- natural aspiration on Mars. Yes. You know, I mean, that's... Right. Sure, infinite poss- possibilities. You can assume something was done. Maybe something was, you know, attached just to your throat. I mean, who, who, who knows? It, uh, but you're talking about you didn't have a, you know... Uh, an environmental... Just food, open right. air on Mars, chilling. Right. You know, floating, you, you, floating you've more got like and you, and you've got you know if it was open air you you know you've got exposure issues because it's wicked cold because it's that much further from the sun so I'm sure it's minus something so I mean it's it's well it was during the day yeah I could I could sit here and try to poke holes in your story and I'd almost rather you know I love Star Star Trek and Star Wars and 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 fantasy and and fiction and I'd I'd almost rather just listen and enjoy it because it's a fascinating absolutely fascinating story sure well uh, we were only out during the day as far as temperature goes it was very cold our suits kept us warm our face was cold and uh we we did missions during the day there and the implications of what i'm seeing of being able to breathe there uh, are huge because that means that we've been out outright lied to by the probes that have been sent Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. We've been programmed so much to believe that you can't breathe on another planet. Yeah. And that means and well, we've been directly lied to. Like they directly have the chemical composition of the atmosphere there. And they say, no, you can't. There's no way. Right. Um, I'm, you know, I'm trying to Google it right now. With our human technology. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing two things here. There is the current state of non-military technology. Yeah, we can't do it. Then you've got secret alien technology. There, I'd be shocked if they can't do this. And there's just a little thing you can clip on the side of your, you know, your neck, and it's like, oh yeah, go out and breathe. It doesn't matter where you are. Right. I'd be shocked if that didn't exist. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, we're going to end the episode right there, but don't worry because part two is coming out next week. Tony's going to start where he left off and take us from Mars to planet Ceres and what his life as a slave was like while he was there for the majority of his 20 and back. He's going to talk about the breakaway civilizations, what the cities were like in Ceres. We're going to discuss wormholes, timeline probability predictors, and so much more. And as a first time ever, Tony is going to be sharing with the Enlighten Up podcast the traumatic return from his 20 and back when they were preparing to put him back into his 10 year old body at home. So don't miss that episode. It's coming out next week. Thank you so much for joining us. We love you all and we'll see you all next week. 
Thank you all for joining our show. We appreciate you tuning in and supporting us. If any of you have any questions you would like answered on the show or any guests that you would like to hear on our show, please email that information to us at info at enlightenup.us or send us a voice message using the Anchor app. There's a super cool feature on there that allows you to send us a message or ask us a question with a touch of a button right from the app. And please continue to support us by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you haven't checked out Nicole's channel on YouTube yet, head on over there for some more insight from her, or you can visit her website, inflexibleme.com, where you can book a personal coaching session or a tarot reading, watch some of her most informative videos, or you can sign up for her newsletter. And if you're interested in some light language healing, head to my YouTube channel, Lisa Loves Love, or send me an email to lisa at lisaloveslove.com to inquire about your own personal reading. Thank you again for joining us and supporting us, and we'll be back with you all next week.